I'm Ming Tan. Last year this time, I was traveling the world, investigating food mysteries, disappearing fish in Indonesia, a butter crisis in France, and a menacing pest in Thailand. Now, the only traveling I do is this. Food deliveries. This is worse than anything I've ever seen. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you. My business is shut. We're screwed. COVID-19 is the most disruptive force the global food industry has ever seen. The whole supply chain is disrupted. In the US, quite a number of the factories had to close because of COVID. So it's a major 30% drop. From farm to table, it is a wake-up call for all of us in this business. Twenty twenty. While a lot of industries took a hit because of COVID nineteen, one business was in overdrive. Especially between April to July. At its peak, we bought seventy four percent more at our supermarkets as compared to the same period last year. To keep up with demand, supermarkets imposed purchase limits. They restocked their shelves more often, and they hired thousands more. But it turned the grocery shopping experience during that period into quite a challenge. In this episode, I want to find out if we should rethink where we shop for our food, and if we are over reliant on our supermarkets. This is what grocery shopping used to look like. Why, why, why? Hey, all the new stock all come today. Ah, right? come ready. I'll show you the condensed ah, yeah, milk. Yeah, yeah. This one, the condensed ah. milk ah, from the condensed cow, very fresh. Right? It was largely personalized and over the counter. Uncle, ah, can yeah. I have the French biscuit? Ah, uh, that's right. Okay. But all this changed with the arrival of the supermarket. For the first time, there were aisles to walk along and a wide range of products to choose from. But supermarkets didn't just bring us new experiences and varieties. They also helped us through crises. Fair Price, for example, was set up during the 1973 oil crisis to keep our food items reasonably priced. This crisis was no different. At the height of the pandemic, we rushed to our supermarkets to stock up on our essentials. But in spite of their best efforts, shelves were still emptying faster than they could be restocked. Which is why food security expert Dr. Cecilia believes the pandemic has made it clear that we need to rethink how we distribute our essentials. Do you think we should reduce our reliance on supermarkets? Yes, we need more options. And we need that people know that there are more options. Options? Decentralization options. That they don't need to use public transportation or, or drive their car. Places that are close to them. If one person had been sick, everybody would have got sick. We need to spread this out, not to have high density of population in the same place. For health, for security, and for options. If I were to ask you to describe the supermarket experience, what would you say? Do you, do you like coming to a supermarket? Yes, there's a lot of variety, because it's aircon. Okay. And then it's big and spacious. Okay. I just get to browse around and get all the stuff. What's your favorite part of the entire supermarket? Looking at the fish. Looking at the fish. I would say that as a young kid, one of my favourite places to go to was the supermarket. And it still is. I'm mesmerised by the wide variety of products, the food ingredients, and just looking and smelling and touching and, and seeing all these lovely things, all these edible things. It's just such a joy. You see, the thing is, a 
lot of what we do in supermarkets is by design, as Professor Mansur is about to show me. The supermarkets use their design assortment, all the decisions are made to basically encourage people, whether consciously or unconsciously, to buy stuff, buy more stuff, and sometimes even buy more expensive stuff. Professor Mansur has brought in two shoppers to prove his point. Hello, lady. Hello. Wasn't anything that you kind of may not have initially planned to buy and you ended up putting in your cart? <laughs> I bought soy while waiting over there. <laughs> So they exist. The sneaky, uh, <laughs> oh, since you're waiting, you might as well put it in, right? I was shopping for a cracker, a packet of cracker, and a lady was telling me, why don't you get three, it's cheaper. So it's like, okay, it's really much cheaper, why not? So I bought three instead of one. And you also had some stuff that you didn't expect to buy Yeah, today, right? I, I don't usually buy oh, candy. Then what else? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Intelligence and temptation, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Psychology of supermarket shopping. From the time you guys moved off to begin shopping to the time that you stopped here, you guys took approximately 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah. This is not my usual supermarket. So a lot of it is not in the right places, you know? Like, why is rice there and then bread on that side? Did that slow you down? It did. Because I kept walking around and stuff. Yeah. Like, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, retailers, right, they want to encourage you to spend more time in store. Uh, so one way to uh, go about it is to occasionally switch things up a bit, even just a little bit, so that you, it disrupts your regular routine. Yeah. And that way the hope is that perhaps you would spend a bit more time, you would linger around, and maybe as you do that, uh, you perhaps may end up considering additional items yeah. or maybe doing something differently, right. uh, buying more stuff. That's very clever. Supermarkets are designed to make you linger and browse. So the question here, how big is the coronavirus risk in our supermarkets? The World Health Organization says it is highly unlikely that people can contract COVID-19 from food or food packaging. So there's no real need to sanitize that apple you just bought. The highest risk is if you're in close contact with other people. Next would be surfaces that are commonly touched, and there are plenty around. Someone who didn't practice good hand hygiene might have touched these surfaces. Studies have also found that COVID-19 particles can linger in the air in crowded or poorly ventilated indoor spaces, and can survive longer in colder and drier air. The thing is, we're still in a pandemic situation and lingering indoors in air-conditioned spaces might not be the safest option. To be fair, our supermarkets have tried to find ways to reduce traffic in their stores. Cold Storage and Giant launched Click & Collect, a service that allows customers to order online for pickup at the store. Whilst Singapore's largest supermarket chain, FairPrice, ramped up their online deliveries. Visit to actually our online website, search between four to five times. <laughs> wait, wait, four yeah, to four five times? times. <laughs> actually, we have also increased our capacity by around 25% to cater to online business. We also converted one of our bread and butter stores into fulfillment centres for online orders. And that's actually a further increase our capacity to more than 50% of it. But what did it take for FairPrice to ramp up capacity to meet our grocery needs? Well, Jonathan has arranged for me to meet Anna. Hello, are you Anna? Oh, hi. So, right now we are at the, our staging room, in a sense. Here is your vest. Wait, my, my vest? Yes. Because... Um, because you'll be doing some orders. So I'm going to pick some yes. of these orders? Yes. All right. Sure, fine. How's that? Does that look good? Yes. Alright, where are we headed first? I will be working as a picker. FairPrice hired over 200 more of them as part of their efforts to expand their online delivery capacity. 
Right, tissues, tissues, yes. tissues. So which one is it? This is uh, uh, that one. Yes, that's right. Okay, so like grab one of these. Yes, you grab one of these. You find the barcode. The barcode scanning button. Yes. Okay. Then you press yes, proceed. Okay, very good. Now we put okay. it in the basket. First item complete. I am so efficient. Right, there we go. Two. So where does this go right now? So this will go to the chiller and the freezer. Okay. To wait upon delivery. Okay, that was fun. Okay, so are you ready to do another one? No, sorry, do another one? Yes. On my I... own? Yes. Plasters, plasters, plasters. Chef Avalon sauce. I'm lost. You don't have, uh, guys. I found a whole rack of abalone sauce, but I can't find this one particular item. I'm not correct. Okay, never mind. Moving on to the next thing. And sealed nicely. I got one more item. I'm behind time already. This order is supposed to go out at six. It's ten minutes to six o'clock. I don't know what the. Oops, sorry. Uh. I see some nuts. Lots of nuts. I feel like a nut. I can hear the angry customer at home going, where are my sugar peanuts? Oh, there we go. I am done, I am done. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It took me almost half an hour to pick up just four items. If this was an interview, I'm pretty sure I've just lost the job. And I'm beginning to see why ramping up online capacity is easier said than done. I'll be honest, it's a fairly tiring process and you feel like you're on the clock, you're running around finding things. This is quite a laborious process. Uh. Yes. Since the beginning of the year, FairPrice has increased their online capacity by more than 50%. But even by dedicating an entire store to fulfilling online orders and hiring more pickers, FairPrice still struggled to meet the surge in online demand. But supermarkets, whether online or brick and mortar, aren't the only places to buy our groceries. We're a foodie nation. There is no lack of places to buy our essentials. Could we have relied more on other places at the height of the pandemic? Is it time to relook the way we shop? Supermarkets, they changed the way we shop. They pioneered the concept of self-service and inspired the creation of the shopping cart. They also expanded our palates with a wide variety of food items. And in just a few decades, the number of supermarkets have multiplied, grown in size, range and sales volume. Today we have more than 500 supermarkets and together they dominate our grocery sales. The pandemic has shown that in a time of crisis, it's simply unsustainable to centralise all our purchasing in one place. Now the circuit breaker is temporary, not a way of life. And while life in our supermarkets has pretty much gone back to normal, COVID-19 has revealed it may not be a bad idea to diversify where we get our groceries. Nithia? Yeah, hey, hey! Hi. Culinary anthropologist Nithia does most of her grocery shopping at our wet markets. One of her favourites is Geelang Serai. What do you think wet markets like these offer versus supermarkets. I think you're definitely, uh, it's quite hard to respect that one metre safe distancing rule in supermarkets. You definitely have a lot more space in wet markets. They are tiny alleyways, but it's, it's easy to space yourself out. If one shop is very crowded, go to another go shop. Go to another shop. Yeah, so I think that's the option that wet markets give you. That flexibility, the community, 
the choice. That's kind of why I would choose wet markets, always. Okay. So what do you think this pandemic right, that we're in right now has exposed about the way people shop? I think what we are really realising with crisis is, as consumers, we really have to decentralise the way we shop. Instead of going to the supermarkets, go to your provision shops, go to your mama shops, you know, go to your wet markets. I mean, in my lifetime, I've already seen the number of wet markets we have has shrunk. The size of them is much, much smaller than they used to be. So when I speak to people of my generation or younger, you know, who are used more to shopping in a supermarket, and I ask them what prevents them from feeling very comfortable in a wet market, yeah. it's very basic things. It's, it's kind of receipts, you know, being able okay. to have a, a tally total of things. Um, it's how things are packaged as well. And also I think it's the appearance of hygiene. Okay, the perception I mean? of cleanliness. Yeah. What do you think wet markets say, mm. should do to keep themselves more relevant as these decentralised locations, mm. smaller hubs for people to shop in? So maybe cashless payments, bring that in. You know, like you look at places like China and stuff. Even your street stalls, you can just pay via your phone cashless payments. I go to supermarkets more than I go to wet markets simply because of the convenience they offer. And I am not alone. A 2019 NEA survey found that 39% of respondents hadn't visited a wet market in the past year. That's nearly double the number in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Can you imagine if we didn't have our wet markets during the circuit breaker period? And that may well be the case in the next pandemic if we continue to overlook our wet markets. What is it going to take to keep them around? Since COVID-19, some savvier stall owners have been moving their business from the wet market to the web market. They join a growing number of live streaming shops that have been popping up on Facebook over the past two years. Selling everything from electronics to cars and fish. It's fastest fingers first. Orders are made through the comments section, and once the bid is successful and payment is made, the items get delivered. Very, very nice. Confirm, very good. Okay. So this guy's videos get up to 70,000 views. That's quite a lot of eyeballs. It's got me thinking, right? Could Facebook Live be a way for wet markets to stay relevant? Every day, thousands visit Fishmonger Max Key's stall at Jurong Fishery Port. Not physically, but virtually. He's been doing this for almost two years now. And he's recently opened another shop that sells exclusively on Facebook Live. Today, I'm joining him on one of his live sessions. Hi guys! Hey, hello! hello. 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 Wow! So many things! We're going to do live stream. We're going to give these things to the customer. We're going to buy the system. They got caught. Okay, we're going to give them a bill. And then we're going to buy the things. We're going to buy the things. We're going to buy the things. Okay, so we're going to give them two bags. 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 听起来蛮容易的嘛。I've been given six items to sell. Good afternoon, everybody. OK， 这个是我们的 Min。Hello， 大家好，我是 Min。Nice to meet you. Yeah. OK， I'm gonna try this. OK， so today we have these handmade white fish cakes. Very nice and firm and bouncy. Flat fish cakes, good for frying. And the code here is FC6 plus one. Yes. The response blew my mind. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pieces sold out. Ah, steady. Thank you, everyone, for your help. Okay. Sold out. How many portions do we have? Twenty-two. Okay, 全部卖完了。谢谢你们。Next up, if you want some pakwa pao, the code is B A K eight. No more already, sold out. Sold out, tidy. Sold out, got it already. 
Nice portions. Two more portions. Two more portions left, guys. No more. We're sold out. Yeah. HZ8 plus one, okay? So, oh, so, we so, thank you for your comments. Okay, it's sold out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I sold close to 400 items within just 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Heidi, I Okay, I'm gonna catch my breath already, right? But this is an amazing way of selling things, and it's incredible how people are responding to his energy. So, as you're selling things, then you're telling them about it, people are asking questions, and then you're responding, and then they're looking at the item, and it's very visceral, it's very real. Shower pot. So, Okay, so in one day, one session, will you sell how many items? One day, now it's about 1,000. 1,000. Wow. 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 其实他们应该卖不到一天这样多的量，没有可能。Maybe 我卖一天哦，有些巴沙汤饭还要卖上一个星期才有。一个星期。一个星期，两个星期才有我的那个 volume。如果我们想要提高巴沙汤饭的他们的生意啦，你觉得做 live streaming 是答案吗？肯定是，我觉得。哎，我觉得我在 live 上面 OK， 我我就把他生意再转上来。做 live stream 这一块，慢慢的改变，慢慢的重新从那边建立。可能线下的生意我们照做，线上我们再来做一块，然后慢慢的这样来改变。Okay, 卖完了，谢谢大家。When circuit breaker hit, some store holders at Teka Market had their first taste of going live. Okay, so guys, I have Australian carrots, cauliflower, tomatoes. The two-day IMDA initiative featured a series of live streaming sessions. Customers could order and receive fresh produce without even setting foot in the market. Now the first one hit more than 20,000 views and sold out within an hour. This is the watermelon. You see, oh, this is watermelon. Ah, Andy, just now, help us cut. Oh, the inside is red, red, sweet, sweet. It's been six months since the launch, and I wonder if they are keeping it up. Actually, a very good thing. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to manage it. Um, I'm not very um, good with tech. Also, oh, now you stop live streaming already. I stop live streaming. Yeah. No, no more. No more. No more. Too troublesome to do. Yeah, troublesome. Not enough manpower. Not enough manpower. I don't understand these English words. Oh, it's more complicated, more difficult. They come to order, I have to tell them what to do. Because they come to order, they come to order. 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 They come to order. If they we got response like every day, uh, then it's uh, then to be uh, possible. Uh. But the response is uh, once in a while, uh, then it's no point doing it. Uh. Just one stall remains. I just want to go home, my brother. I see a phone. Hello. Hello, nice Hello. 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 呃，你是做什么东西来的？这个电话啊，直播 ，online selling 是吗 ？Yes, yes. Yeah. 阿弟，我在这个德格玛格啦走来走去，是唯一的还在做这个 online sales。你为什么还在做？为什么还在做？啊，有效吗？有效吧，慢慢做就有效啦。So out of the six stallholders that were listed in the Teka Online uh, website, 
it seems like only one has carried on to do live streaming on a daily basis and it doesn't seem quite as useful for the remainder of the storeholders. My question is this, right? If web markets want to continue remaining relevant uh, to a younger crowd, especially if footfalls are dropping to web markets, then don't they need to figure out ways to sustainably innovate and really get on to this uh, and remain as relevant as possible? Live streaming may not be for everyone. But one company is trying to convince these stallholders to give the digital transformation another shot. Online marketplace Tada Fresh launched after the circuit breaker hit. They provide an online delivery service for wet markets. So we saw a lot of live streaming in wet markets, right? Mm. But as far as I know, not all of it like really took off. Mm. Right? How is Tada Fresh different from that? So just by going on to live stream alone, they have to be prepared to do the filming do the selling, do the delivery, and do the post-sale service. That's a lot of work for them. But on Tada Fresh Market, all they need to do, they receive their WhatsApp, they know what's the orders for them, they pack the orders according to the items that we send Hi. them. Morning. Thank you. The next day, somebody comes along to collect, somebody delivers the items for them, and somebody, we have a customer service team that actually responds to the customer's inquiries and feedback after the sales is completed. So you guys fill that gap and plug it. Exactly. So we definitely want to help these wet market uh, vendors bridge a digital gap. Can a service like this continue to survive now that the circuit breaker mm. period is over? Mm. Even though the circuit breaker uh, period is over, we still do see uh, the stream of orders uh, they're coming in consistently. And our customers who have tried fresh produce delivered directly from the wet markets told us that they will never shop at a supermarket or even buy from an online supermarket grocer ever again. Yeah, just cause it's so much more value for money. It's actually our goal to like digitalize most of the wet markets in Singapore and in fact all if we can because we do want to like prolong the longevity of wet markets in Singapore. It took two weeks to convince the stallholders at Teka Market. And now they've got 24 stalls and two markets on the platform. Next on their list, Badok North Wet Market. I want to find out how to get these stall holders on board. So I'm joining Tadar Fresh for the day. So our aim, right, is to get at least one vendor from each category, like at least one selling fruits, vegetables, poultry, pork, you know, so, so that we can bring the market online. Okay, steady. Mm. Just minutes in, and I'm starting to realize it's no easy feat. About how we can get your products online. I think I think for now, for now, no, not yet. We are not ready yet. Uh, Thank you. Okay, it seems a lot of the storeholders are quite resistant to coming on board with us. Uh, they haven't really given us a great response. And it's a little bit frustrating. I'm not even sure that we're going to be able to get this uh, market up and online. I'm with Taga Fresh a delivery platform providing ordering and logistics for wet market vendors. I'm helping them to convince stallholders at Pasar 216 Badok Central to get on board their online portal. But it's been more than an hour and this situation doesn't look Hello, promising. Sir, good morning. If we I get it, it's an alien concept uh, for a traditionally very analog business. They have close uh, links with their customers, they see the same regulars every day, everything is very human to human transactions. Uh, this will take some getting used to, but it's up to 
up to us and this generation are supposed to try and help convince uh, this generation of hawkers and, and web market store holders uh, that there are benefits to get on board this sort of platform. All right, let's go find some more. Maybe they'll have a better reaction sure. of us. Yeah, I feel yeah. that I can sell this handmade dumplings that you're making right on oh, our yeah, website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, yeah. Can can. Can Interested? Uh? Finally, okay, our persistence good. is paying off. That's it, Biao Fu Zadong Si, Piu Jiang, deliveries, la, hai si, online, some orders, la, me, yi tian, si, her, zai, yi, chi, ah, we will pang ni, ampai, the. Okay, okay. Okay, how, si, si. Ah, okay. This, uh, this market, Bedok market, is the third market that we want to bring online. Okay. Uh, and then we will do the delivery for you. Okay, okay, okay. So try lah, we try bit by bit, first step by first. Okay, okay. So, okay. Thank I you very like, much. I don't like that. him to try also lah. Anyway, it's going to benefit me. Why I don't want to try. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Over the course of the week, the Tada team manages to convince six small stalls on board. Hey, good news! The seafood vendor decided to work with us. That's almost a quarter of the market that's going online. So it's been almost a month since we were last at this market. Now the page has finally gone live, and today we're here to pick up our orders from the vendors for the very first time. Okay, 24 confirmed. Uh, 10号. 10号, okay. So watermelon and some strawberries. We'll be collecting almost 30 orders from across 11 stalls. Okay. So today, okay, ma? Okay, la, hai hao, hai hao. Hai hao, hai hao. Hai hao, la. Very good. So how do you think this system can help wet market vendors uh, become a viable alternative during this kind of period? So I mean, I'll let the numbers do the talking. So in Teka market alone, right, I've seen orders go up to the hundreds in a day. And to the extent that we could not complete delivering all the orders in one cycle, we had to nice. do multiple cycles. So I think that itself you know, says a lot how a wet market is actually a very viable alternative for consumers at home. I think that the wet market right, is like inherently in our culture, but at the same time, it is also kind of like a sunset industry. When I chat with the vendors you know, in my free time, a lot of them shared with me that they are old and they have children, but they don't want to take over the business. Perhaps the idea of selling something in a wet market could be uncool to them. But now that we introduce the online element for them, it kind of gets their children interested. Wet markets aren't the only alternatives to supermarkets. Remember this? They used to be found in every HDB estate. Family-run provision shops that sell pretty much everything, including my favourite ice creams that I used to love as a kid. Yeah. Since then, I've hardly gone to a provision store. In fact, I can't remember the last time I went to one of those. In the 1980s, more than 3,000 provision shops dotted our landscape. But as more supermarkets popped up across the island, provision shops were slowly phased out. Today, less than 200 remain. Luckily for Ting Ting, her favourite one still exists. It's close to her childhood home in Serangoon. You know, this provision shop is really nostalgic for me. So, Uncle belongs to that generation of provision shop owners that knows every little item in a shop, you know, including their prices. Wow, okay, I want to have some fun with this. I want to ask. Okay, root beer. Which one does it? Five pan. Yakao, Colgate. You sign five chill. Oh, he really remembers everything. Okay, uh, chicken essence, brand's chicken essence. 17.50. Fast oh. ready, fast ready. Okay, Fast so is light colours. This is, um, <laughs> Uncle is remembering all his prices offhand. This is a requisite to own a provision shop. Requisite, it's a requirement. 
Ting Ting is a historian. She's documented some of our oldest provision shops as part of an e-book series by the National Heritage Board. Well, they're still relevant. In fact, we don't realise how important a provision shop is until you need something, suddenly, something random, right? They serve the community uh, directly, very near. Uh, this is like at a void deck or walking distance, uh, nearer than usually the supermarkets unless you live next door to one. So I know of provision shop owners who will actually deliver the goods upstairs. At least they, they know who is mobile, who is not mobile. And they will go the extra distance uh, for those who needed help. The other thing about provision shops like this is because it's uh, family run or personally owned, um, you can talk to the shop owners directly, right? And in whatever kind of needs that you might have or something that you're looking for. And they sell in smaller quantity. Smaller quantities. Give me an example of that. So for example, if you don't want to buy the whole tree of eggs, you don't want to buy 10 eggs, you want to buy by per egg, you can buy a bit of garlic, just want to cook that one meal and... Uh, you know, you go to the supermarket, you have to buy this whole bag of it. And then use one bit and throw the whole rest away. Ting Ting, what do you think the pandemic showed us about the importance of these provision shops? They are a good alternative source when people started stockpiling and the supermarket was crowded with people. I, I didn't like the idea of squeezing with everybody and queuing up so many hours and all. A big crowd, right? Yeah. So I went to the provision shop and asked, like, do you have this and that? They said, yeah, like, we have a lot of it. During the, the pandemic period, did you see a surge in customers coming to buy things from your store? Yes, yes. Yeah, I was very busy every day. Even Monday is my day off. I also got to queue open on Mondays so that I won't be overwhelmed on a Tuesday. So they did see this as a very good alternative. And in fact, whoever started to come there then, right, have become a regulars now. But while some of us did turn to provision shops at the height of the pandemic, these vanishing shops faced another problem. So were you able to meet this surge in demand when these people came in to buy things? When we couldn't get it from our regular suppliers, we took it as an alternative of ourselves going to the shopping malls, of the mega malls, of the essential services to replenish the stock, you know. Oh, you will buy from the supermarket? Yeah, I will buy from the supermarket. And then I will bring it back and then to, to sell it in the shop. And because we are uh, just a standalone shop. So the suppliers sometimes uh, too small amount, they wouldn't uh, want to entertain us. So that's challenging? Yeah, yeah very challenging. So they will uh, su su supply to the, those uh, big supermarkets. I also will negotiate with my suppliers that maybe you can give me some, or at least some that can let me supporting for my residents, my neighbour here. Some of us did turn to our trusty family-run provision stores in the early days of the pandemic. And while the demand was there, the supply simply couldn't keep up. Hi, can I get this too also, Uncle? Thank you very much. Let's face it, in times of crisis, the big boys will always dominate our supply chain. Thank you very much, Uncle. But if there's one thing we've learnt, it is that there is a good reason to keep provision shops going, so that they're around when we need them they provide a viable alternative. That is, if they don't close, for good. Day is kind of a bro way of saying hi in Tamil. But this is the day I'm referring to. It's a website. Here day stands for daily everything. And the man behind it, Jay. He isn't just helping provision shops move online. He's also helped some of them ensure a steady supply of goods during the circuit breaker. When there was the lockdown, what was the gap that you saw uh, to help these provision stores? Traditional stores are very small. And in terms of the buying power, it's very small. Two things, he doesn't have the space, he doesn't have the kind of um, cash to um, stock up, so, stock much, up right? such, uh, so much of goods. So when the lockdown happened, nobody was willing to supply them. 
So things were off the shelf. There are no resupply, so basically it was an empty shelf. What we did was we contacted all the wholesalers. We started to buy in bulk. Because the thing is, we had the resources to buy in larger volumes. And with that, we ended up supplying to the merchant stores as well. So this kept the supply chain intact. It kind of still allowed them to function as a business. But once you started to purchase wholesale from suppliers, you could already just get that in direct sales to, to, to consumers, right? Because the majority of people who buy on e-commerce are the millennials. Okay. But Generation X, basically, some of them are okay with buying online, but most of them prefer to just walk down to buy. So the thing is, we still had to cater to this group of people. So you guys have had close interaction with a lot of these little stores, right? So in your interactions with them, right, what kind of position do they have in the greater marketplace for goods and, and provisions that's important for Singaporean communities? I think it's a very good question. To me, I'll say the reason is to have multiple channels to make sure the goods flow through the market. Supermarkets have limitations. It's costly to actually go into a supermarket to get your products listed. There's a lot of fees, a lot of things you have to pay for. So many of them use the traditional channels to actually push the other goods. And that's one of the biggest thing in terms of uh, the supply chain. So supermarkets play a key part. Probably about 35% of our sales, but traditional merchants also contribute close to about 20%. So it's about time we start respecting them, start taking them serious and see how we can help them survive, at the same time adapt to this new norm. Our provision shops are invaluable. Not just because they're convenient. There are so many gems you'll find in provision stores like this that you won't find anywhere else. And I'm not just talking about biscuits like this. Hi guys, uh, let's take a look at the wall behind me. These are scenes that you highly find today, except in some very old school provision stores. And then you have savoury stuff. You've got these wheel cookies, these lovely tasty things. And then some very ASMR fish crackers, crunch, crunch, crunch. But my favourite of all, the ultimate thing that I like to find in these provision stores is a tub of gem biscuits. But I've learned that nostalgia isn't the only reason why we need to have them stick around. So for example, if you don't want to buy the whole tree of eggs, you don't want to buy 10 eggs, you want to buy by per egg, Sometimes they, they will make the exception if they don't usually sell that in small quantity. Supermarkets tend to sell things in pre-packed sizes. So if I wanted to buy, say, a single chilli, or two pieces of lemongrass, or three stalks of spring onion, it's going to be tough. I had to buy the whole pack. And these packs are measured for generally a family of three to four people. But what if you stay alone? So one more reason to look at where we buy all of our food is to realise how much of it we tend to waste. In 2019, we wasted more than 700,000 tonnes of food. That's about 20% more than a decade ago. One company wants to stop this unnecessary waste. And they're starting by helping you shop differently. They're sending these to your house. Pre-portioned meals for everyday cooking. So they're supposed to be like your home-cooked daily meals, but without all the fuss. Uh, these ingredients are measured out no more and no less. It's just out of the box and into the pan. Prepped, the meal kit company, doesn't just want to make cooking quick and easy. They also want to keep it waste-free. The processes here at Prepped are very geared towards uh, minimising food waste, being very exact to the portions. Why are you guys so big on this? I mean, if anything, the pandemic challenged um, the fact that the status quo that we take for granted is actually very fragile. Mm -hmm. You can blame supermarkets a little bit for the overbuying because they control the portion sizes that we can buy, but we really aren't doing enough as individuals, as a society, to reduce food waste. There was an NEA study that found that 50% of the total waste that our household throws out 
um, is food waste. Now, you might not have heard of meal kits, but in the US, they've been around for years. And when COVID-19 hit and cities there entered lockdown, demand for these home-cooked meals soared. So can they be a viable alternative to supermarkets? It is an option out there so that people don't only think, oh, if I want to buy fresh food or I want to cook at home, the supermarket is my only option. And the second thing is working from home. Yep. So previously, when you were in an office, you would run down just buy what you need for that meal. But now that everyone's working from home, um, there's also a lot more grocery shopping happening, a lot more people going out and buying in the quantities that they may not necessarily be using. And so then you get that overbuying um, happening to a larger extent as well, as more people stay home, believe that they will cook more, and maybe don't end up finishing all that they buy. It's not just about changing where we buy, but controlling what we buy. Wet markets, provision shops, meal kits, they all allow you to do that in their own small way. As a food lover interested in all things food, I will be extremely disappointed to lose them. I have learned that as consumers, we must support them to keep them in business. They are essential, they provide an overlapping but crucial role in Singapore's grocery supply business. And more options can only be good in a time like this.